The plot to Perry Mason's second season thickens, and we'll sort through the evidence. The Mandalorian may have a problem, and Bob Odenkirk is back on AMC as the titular Lucky Hank. All that on this week's episode of the podcast. I love a tape projection. Hey, welcome to Taking It Down, the TV and movie podcast produced by the Alabama Take. I'm Blaine Duncan, editor-in-chief of the Alabama Take and one of the hosts for the show. Taking It Down's here because I thoroughly enjoy dissecting why I like what I like and why I dislike what I dislike when it comes to TV, movies, even books and music. I have an English degree and a side hustle as an English teacher, so I'll try my best to offer insight that you can use in conversation with others or with us. Luckily, my ideas aren't the only set of viewpoints on the podcast each week, because with me every week are these three. Adam Morrow, who's an erudite traveling and studio musician with a penchant for fine literature. Donovan Reinwald, a media specialist with encyclopedic knowledge on film and more. Plus, Natalie Morrow, the first person to ask about fantasy, sci-fi, comics, trashy reality TV, and Beyonce's music. From us, you'll get the obvious and the obscure, we're here for the TV and film obsessed who are too busy for anything more than the show or movie itself. We'll give the outside of Hollywood analysis with zero Southern stereotype. Well, other than me, today there's only one more host. Here he is. He's not only the assistant coach of UConn Huskies basketball, but he's also the chair of the East Connecticut State Media Department. Donovan Ronwald. Great to be here, Blaine. It, did, did I get the one of those colleges at least right? Yeah, yeah, you got UConn right, and there is a uh, there's an Eastern Connecticut State University, so you got your two for two. No, I meant where you literally work. Actually, oh, no, I work at Middlesex Community College. Oh, why did I think <laughs> East Connecticut St- uh, State College? I don't know. <laughs> because Where'd you that's get that in, from. Um, isn't it in? It's in Willimantic, or Wyndham. Wyndham. I was going to say yeah. Wyndham. I, I was trying to think. I, my, my mind kept thinking Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks. Why am I thinking Twin Peaks? <laughs> it's funny what your brain will connect to. Anyway, that's us. It's just us two. Just us chickens. Just us two chickens. No no real roosters on the farm today. <laughs> no Adam and no Natalie. <laughs> oh, we've been demoted. We're going to talk about some Perry Mason and uh, his motorcycle. In actuality, the plot is started laying out a few more strings to tie together. I'm still too mad about you spoiling whether or not he gets on his motorbike every episode to really have a civil discussion about this. Well, I didn't spoil the big thing about it, though, which was, <laughs> which was he let his kid ride. Yeah, he he right. took his kid to school on it and, and caught flack, uh, at least trouble. from side eyes. This is not related to the pro- plot, but it is... His his kid is so inconsequential to me in this show. Went to Teddy's school in the first episode, second episode? First episode, I think. I was like, oh, since when does he have a kid? Is yeah. he introducing something new? Yeah. Exactly. No, I just didn't care about it. <laughs> he's only in about two or three episodes in the first season. Yeah, he's barely there. Let's catch everybody up. We're at the third episode of the second season of Perry Mason. I think we're all in on this. It's been good so far. We'll be spoiling it up through the third one, so beware of that. Perry's back in the saddle, but I suppose back on the motorcycle of criminal defense. He's, he's, he's really back on the motorbike. Yeah, in more than one way. And he's attempted to help out two brothers who are accused of murdering a, a one percenter. <laughs> yeah, prominent prominent figure. Prominent figure. One percenter's son, at least, I suppose yeah. you could say. Yeah, we could start with the motorcycle, but yes, the son even feels inconsequential here because it's more of a device to get him to go talk to the teacher again. Mm-hmm. I mean, it it was kind of fun. Like it was kind of funny when he's like, "You want to go to a movie?" <laughs> and then they go see King Kong. Like that was that made me chuckle. That was nice. And then the the horror of the school marm <laughs> saying, "You saw King Kong?" <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but you're right. It was just to reintroduce the teacher. I don't know. I felt chemistry. I, I yeah. thought it was. I thought it was okay. I really was like, oh yeah, he's going to probably end up dating her, and it's going to be awkward. And I'm kind of, I'm okay with that slight little C or D or E plot. <laughs> you know, give Perry something to 
to do besides look wistfully at his broken pictures. <laughs> he needs he needs something else in his life. <laughs> he need, he needs happiness. Other because that apparently the drive out to the old farm is way too long to hook up with the oh, with the current that. order owner. She she of uh, probably Mexican descent. I think she's she, supposed to be Mexican. Yeah, and she also do you remember in the first season she also helped him by piloting a plane. She's yes, an excellent pilot. And, yeah. And, one of my favorite moments in the first season is when uh, they're in bed together and he falls out of the bed. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned that earlier. Love, love it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So this show is is kind of straight laced, straightforward. It, you know, it's noir in a way. There's not a lot of yeah. room for comedy, but I did find that kind of funny where she was like, "Oh, I didn't know that a child should go to King Kong," and then of course, <laughs> us nearly a hundred years later are like, "Oh, come on." Just wait. Like taking him to King Kong is the equivalent to taking a kid to The Exorcist in the seventies, or <laughs> to, to what Saw in the in the late nineties. Let's get it. Let's start unpacking this. The reason why I want to talk about it this week in particular is because of the plot. I wanted to make sure I had it all straight. I don't think I have it all straight. I tried my best. In fact, I think that's what makes us who we are. Is we we come from an outsider's point of view. Let me just say, I'll start with saying that I'm a big proponent of shows that use and movies that use another time period to reflect on our own, Mm -hmm. whether it's serendipitous or purposeful. Um, Perry Mason had those moments once again this week, uh, and they deepened those from last week when he talks about the Mexican-American guys in jail, and he's talking to the judge, and he says they don't have control of their own future because of their station in life. He mentions that sort of to the judge, but he also brings it up again. And the lawyer of the McCutcheon, gentleman who's been killed by someone he's was trying to play the feel sorry for the super rich people card which is one we hear you turn on fox news or anything to the right of that and you hear these poor people who have a billion dollars you know barely get by they can barely get by now granted on this show the mccutcheons do have a murdered son and that yes death is horrible uh it's 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 hard to deal with especially if it's a father who's grieving for a son or a father grieving for a child mother grieving for a child that's not the way it kind of should work usually okay they get my sympathy there but not with the way the lawyer and the father is you know they got that hint of evil around them and and, you know it's, it's again i said it earlier it's noir they are our antagonist for the season and did you pick up on the they're playing this in a way that's a bit of a statement? They're they're writing this in a way that's a bit of a statement about our current climate. The, the immigration or lack thereof aspect of it really, you know, because it's a little bit about like who belongs and who gets justice, who is afforded justice, who is important enough for justice. Who, yeah, I think I think they're not. I mean, maybe they are laying it on a little, a little thick sometimes. But I, I, I really don't think it's that heavy-handed. I was just going to say it's more like Perry's comments and the lawyer's comments, and it kind of develops from there. In, in fact, the only thing I found heavy-handed this season are two things, I should say. Mm-hmm. The teacher relation, you can see the spark in their eye. You know exactly where this is going. But the other big thing was the, the villainous turn of the McCutcheon patriarch, Oh yeah, when he uh, when he assaults the worker, that yeah. felt really hamfisted to me. And it's one of the few times that this show has been, you know, a little too hamfisted. It's like we we get it. He's evil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like he's a bad guy. <laughs> On the other side of the coin is that his talk with Mason was a better reveal. Mm-hmm. His talk with Perry at the ra- uh, horse race. I'm losing my my terminology. But anyway, oh, racetrack. He, Race track, that's it. You, yeah, you, you bet. The dialogue was working much better there. He was more threatening there. He signals he can do things. And kind yeah. of, he he mentions the long gone Mason farm. <laughs> and, and he's like, oh, well, he can mind out some things, right? He's mm-hmm. not. He has his own detectives, of course. You, I mean, they didn't do anything groundbreaking with mm-hmm. that, but I thought that it was... Um... It was menacing. More, more, like you said, more overtly... Or more menacing than when he overtly, you know, smashes or not smashes, cuts that guy's face up with the 
Yeah. Um, and I think part of that is like Matthew Reese's mm-hmm. performance is a mix of like bravado and but he's also scared. Like mm-hmm. like when he's walking down the hall, he's kind of looking around nervously before mm-hmm. he goes out into the racetrack. And I think that that really kind of helps add to the, the the like the menace there. You know, you make a good point there. Your acting partner, it's a lot like wrestling. I, mm-hmm. I don't know how deep you ever got into wrestling, but honestly, it, it comes down to, in wrestling and acting apparently, that your partner can make and break you. In wrestling, if they don't sell it, if it's them that's taking the bump, and if they don't look like they're legitimately hurt, then you're not believing this particular wrestler has any power over the other guy or girl in the ring. And so when Perry is talking to him, he does have an expression of, you know, it, it drifts into, you're not going to scare me, to, oh, I didn't know you knew that. That is kind of frightening. Mm-hmm. And I think that having the son in this episode is supposed to work in a manner to get Perry near the teacher, but also to remind you that, that the son could be in danger because this guy has mm-hmm. knowledge of, of L.A. stuff. I wondered... And they're probably not doing this, but I wondered if they were going to or are going to parallel Perry's fatherhood with um, Mr. Mr. I can't remember his first name, Mr. McCutcheon. Uh, I can't remember his first name either. Um, I, I can only remember his son's name, Brooks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me, uh, mean old Mr. McCutcheon. I, I, but I wonder if if that's going to be ever contrasted with. Um, like the way he's reacting versus the way Perry will will react or, or is reacting to something involving his kid. I don't know, probably not. But I thought it was might be interesting. Wasn't there a illusion or two in the first season that Perry had trouble with his own father? Mm-hmm. I think so. I would be interested to see. I, it, it's an opportunity that they could do. Yeah, like like you said earlier, it's probably like down there in the E plot. Yeah, it could be. You know, it may not be. <laughs> <laughs> that important, but uh, it would give Perry something to, to do other than, yeah, stare sadly at death oh. certificates, <laughs> Dodson's <laughs> old newspaper clippings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the classic moves of the more high level dramas or complicated dramas is they don't mind being a little complex with their conversations. Mm-hmm. Just but they don't hold your hand through some of them. I think broadcast television tend to shy away from that kind of thing because they want you to tune in every single week. It's so much more based on advertising dollars. This episode did the thing where they throw in a lot of information in short conversations. but And it's kind of one of those things where you go, I didn't get that, but I, uh, they're going to probably explain it. I just need to make a put a pin in that for just a little bit. That's the way I felt about a lot of the plot point. Even things look like it's not really information, but like at the end where he find like the bullets match up. Mm-hmm. I'm it's it's and it's like okay, this is important, but they don't they don't bother telling you why it's important. They're just mm-hmm. you just kind of have to trust that like they're gonna all will be revealed. It's like when uh, Perry Mason asked the Nygaard lady who was swimming in her really mm-hmm. nice pool. He asked her about San Haven, and everyone watching probably thought. Are we supposed to know about San Haven? Yeah. Is that from season one? And it wanted you to signal, or it wanted to signal to you that, hey, this is a key piece of information because of her reaction. She yes. flipped she flipped a switch and said, I'm not going to talk about such as that. And you think, wait, was Brooks McCutcheons involved in something I missed? Yeah, I almost, I mean, obviously, like you said, they we know it's important from her reaction even though it's just tossed off. But that was when I was watching it. I was like, where did he learn about this? Where did he get that name from? I could not remember. It was from looking through the evidence in, at the end of episode one or sometime in episode two. Oh, you're didn't, right. Didn't, and it was, it was one of those pieces of evidence that was, or the only piece of evidence in the files that were, was put in by a gloved hand. That's right. So we That's don't right. know much other than that or why it's even being brought up. So it took me a while to kind of put that together. And we, we know that we've already seen that book Brooks has some unsavory dealings and some uh, exotic tastes when it comes to amorous encounters. So it, mm-hmm. could, be, it mm-hmm. could be uh it could be almost anything. Would you say hinted hinted might not even be strong enough of a word that he was into some kinky stuff, like he had 
it was, I guess it is hinted that he's choking one of his yeah, he, paramours there, he, his mistresses. He, uh, the waitress on the, or whatever she is on the boat, you know, when they first introduced her, she's coughing. Yeah. She's been, you know, he used a belt on her. That's right. Yeah. And she's like, he's like, thanks for being a good sport. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> what a great way to encapsulate all that without being overt. Mm-hmm. One complaint I have about shows, all shows these days, uh, is my Homer Simpson's dad yelling at the cloud moment. Uh-huh. They they don't linger on text messages or writing, because Perry finds some initials on the back of a picture in this episode, and I'm squinting my eyes and probably need my glasses nearby. But it's apparently the there's a hospitalized young lady whose last name is Lawson, mm-hmm. and it must be her brother's initials in the in the picture. She is catatonic. He's figured out she's somehow connected. This mm-hmm. is the Sam Haven plot. He's figured out she's somehow connected to Brooks McCutcheon's, maybe a former lover, maybe a former mistress of some sort, and she's now catatonic. And you got this... So that's my complaint. But it does produce a pretty good moment of creepiness where he takes her picture while she's just staring yeah, straight ahead. she's just staring. That, that was kind of unsettling, I guess, is the word to use. So is she in such a mental state because he choked her too and some oxygen loss? I it seems like there it's you know it's something that reflects badly on Brooks in some way, but I, I'm not I'm not willing to venture a guess quite yet because although I do kind of think they're setting it up where they want us to think that this is a former mistress mm-hmm. that he's done something to. Now, what her brother's initials have anything to do with? All of that is yet to be determined. Holcomb, the detective from season one, the crooked detective, who's also <laughs> really not doing much detective work in season two because he's, no, no, he's, <laughs> he's got all his uh, eggs in the basket of gambling ship. You load the ship, and when it goes off offshore, you can gamble. <laughs> he comes home, tells the, tells the lady of the house, you know, just doing paperwork at the, at the detective yeah. office. Staying up late. Uh, does he even bother to show up at, yeah, exactly. at, the, at the station anymore? Does he have a job? He seems like he's got a pretty full plate with the whatever that ship's name is. Of course, that, that that's going to come in and be. Yeah. It's one of those threads that's laid out. You mentioned Paul Drake shooting the guns. I, I did like Paul's kind of subplot this week because we got to see him do some some of that fun kind of detective work that we didn't that Perry was doing in the first season it was kind of like and he's done a little bit this season but this was that kind of like sleuthing around yeah this is why you watch these sort of shows yeah because Paul Drake shooting those guns into water waterlogged uh telephone books that he's stolen from the street corners (laughs) so he's he's shooting them and as a substitute of uh what a bullet can do in a body or or at least when it has impact on something did the brothers do it did they they did rent a gun apparently. Uh, so they did it seems like they rented a gun and something is important about that bullet mark mm, well it matches i think the evidence that perry went and slew right so they rented that particular gun it leads paul drake back to the uh the old hooverville spot and and tells the guy renting out guns you did rent it to these two mexican guys and the answer is yes I am still inclined to think that the brothers are innocent, basically are being railroaded. Uh, yeah. The, the evidence against, you know, it's all circumstantial. It seems very flimsy. They're being railroaded in a pretty high-level way if yeah. the gun's brought into play as well. Yeah, they are. Because Paul Drake, um, he paid to borrow. He rented out, like, all of the... <laughs> 38s or whatever that mm-hmm. he ended up getting and it was just the only there was only the one that matched i, I did like he's like who rents guns <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but shooting a rat for supper we're allowed the first encounter he has with gun <laughs> rental is with kids <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah i'm i did kind of like this, this just made me think about it uh perry's encounter with the judge to uh, about trying to get the the, the brothers more uh, out of like the general population, somewhere safer. I, I don't know. I I like a lot of those scenes with with Matthew Reese because he does a good job of getting like Perry's smart and determined, 
but also he's he's you know he, he's kind of like you can't fight city hall so he's always sailing into the wind too idealistic yeah maybe to the point that's why he's dissolution he was too idealistic the first absolutely round. though i don't i think that expecting someone not to go off and drown themselves isn't very idealistic but he's still disappointed as how it all turned out case included yeah what do you think about the subplot with um oh jeez i always do this i can't remember anyone's name his uh his partner and her della della that's right della's um new bow is it is it doing anything for you or is it is it a distraction from the from the main heft of the plot Honestly, that's one of the times during the show where I am a little less interested Mm -hmm. because it hasn't turned into anything more that Della can do. Or, I mean, it's not even a will they, won't they? Right, because it's it's, pretty clear they will. Yeah, (laughs) they have. (laughs) Yeah, it's just an affair. The weird thing is they they haven't even shown Della's uh, girlfriend from the first season. Mm-hmm. Much, yeah. I think she might have been in the background of one scene, but that... I think she was on the phone once. Yeah, and I don't so, think she's been like present. So you know, you you start to wonder what's the point. But I do have confidence that that will somehow cash out. But maybe yeah. not. Maybe it's just we need to have Julia Julia Rylance do more than just detective and lawyer work. You're you're right. It might just be they're trying to like give her character another facet Mm -hmm. i I agree with you though i I think that it's um it hasn't become weighty yet yeah i don't find it distracting i just find it less interesting i i would agree with that yeah we uh very well could bring back up perry mason i'm I'm enjoying it yeah me too i always i I enjoyed that first season a, a lot and this one seems at least as good we may come back to it let's take a break and talk Mandalorian and Lucky Hank on the other side of this little bitty ad. Not only is there WWE and AEW, but the South is full of great indie wrestling. Who do you want analyzing what you've watched or covering what you missed? Supervan Corey Hanna and former indie wrestler Patrick Akers give you the news and the takeaways every Friday morning on Alabama Slam. Find it on the alabamatake.com or in any podcast app. Search Alabama Slam. Okay, let's spend some time on The Mandalorian, particularly from this week. Uh, it's an episode called Chapter 20, The Foundling. It's the fourth of season... Is this season three of The Mandalorian? This is season three, yeah. Yeah, it gets a little confusing if you've watched The Book of Boba Fett and you forget what's what. Yeah, that was season two and a half. Yeah, exactly. I... <laughs> I had a lot of fun with Josh K on the show, and I really enjoyed the moment where he found out that he was going to have to watch the book of Boba Fett uh-huh. if he wants me, to have any idea what's going on. Me too. Listeners, <laughs> if you missed that, it's the last week. We had Josh on the show, and he was very angry to find out he quit <laughs> Boba Fett too early. The Foundling had Carl Weathers cooking Dreading up the stew. It. Yeah, he yeah. cooked up the stew, didn't he? I thought that was great. <laughs> I did too. He's not in the episode, but he did direct it. He's around. Ahmad Best played the saving Jedi for Grogu. He also played Jar Jar Binks. Really? You haven't seen that floating around online? No. It's everywhere now. Yeah. So the actor Ahmad Best, he's the black actor who who saves Grogu. He's a Jedi in this episode, but he, he played Jar Jar Binks. I think his name is Kelleran. He also had an appearance in an online game in the early aughts that was like a game show Jedi kind of weird thing. I never, (laughs) yeah, I never played it. He was the host, but okay. If John Favreau or Dave Filoni are listening, here's my advice. Quit fucking around and bring back Jar Jar. (laughs) We all want, everyone wants to know what happened. Get some courage, blow the doors off the joint, and have that some bitch come stumbling in a scene. He doesn't even have to say anything. Just have it happen, and, just, and you will light the him, internet on fire. Just have him motionless in the background. He's just standing there like a statue. 
Yeah, this episode gave you two pl- two plots basically, which was this had a this episode maybe had a little too much and too little going on at the same time. That's weirdly the case, right? So yeah, the one was we had a foundling Mandalorian kid scooped up by some sort of pterodactyl type creature dinosaur-esque flying creature assumedly to eat later and they can't get him back in time without running out of fuel in their jetpacks and then the b plot is the grogu (laughs) flashback scene where you find out yeah he was in the temple of the jedis during order 66 where you know they tried their best to kill all jedis i don't think they got them all they They didn't get get grogu they didn't get grogu who else did they not get they didn't get grogu they didn't get uh, Kenobi, and they didn't apparently get the Rosario Dawson character yeah, who's uh, coming. What's, what's her name? Ahsoka. Ashoka. Uh huh. So Although, she's gonna have her own show. So apparently she survived somehow. Right. All right. So and there's you know they've kind of hinted that others you know like in um in Kenobi in Obi Wan one of the in the first episode the Inquisitors or whatever they are. Actually, mm-hmm. are ending like are tracking down a Jedi who they're tracking down the last of them, right? Yeah, so yeah, that's their goal. Yeah, we'll let our guys that we are a Star of War podcast handle some of this. I'm I'm sure listeners are tired of me saying this, and now I think Natalie <laughs> has joined the chorus when she's here. But this Grogu stuff has got to move on at a faster clip. It's got do a time jump. I don't care what you do. It, just have him learn a few words or <laughs> maybe just get a half inch taller just the cutesy gaga part of him is hackneyed at this point it so when the focus is off of him i think the show really soars if you'll forgive the pun in there it's just bogged down by that but it's bogged down by two things here are my two problems. okay I'm yeah, gonna, yeah, i'll yeah. let you respond no no grogu, go ahead grogu it's too cutesy gaga I, uh-huh I, Say, you know, I, it's hard to act with someone who can't say anything but baby sounds. And the second thing is, I mentioned it last week briefly, it's the helmet thing. You know, <laughs> everyone's in helmets. Mm-hmm. So those are two problems for me. Now, is the show good? Yeah, it's it's quite good. But you take those out, and I think it ups a level, whatever that level is. There's, I, I agree with you about the helmets, because, uh, you know, there's a reason that, like, most superhero movies find a way to, like, either show you under the mask or the mask gets destroyed or something because it's just every, everyone's like standing around with blank faces basically. Mm-hmm. I didn't think that the show was a little nuts when it had like, oh, Grogu's going to fight the, the other kid. It was like, what, what is going on here? <laughs> what part of it did you find so ridiculous? It's just everything. It's like he's too, you know, they're like, he's small. <laughs> he puts him down. And he's like, you know, like a little lump of sack of potatoes or something. He's a half foot. Yeah, you know, he's just, uh, Pedro, uh, or what's his name, Jin Jaren. It, yeah, well, just... whoever's in the goddamn costume, I'm not even <laughs> sure Pedro Pascal's in this show anymore. Yeah, you think it might be a, uh, a a James Earl Jones situation where he he's just, like, well he, he's just, he's at home, he's, he's recording the voice and that's it? I mean, why not? <laughs> But yeah, he sits him down and he's he, he's starting his Mandalorian training. You know, he, he gets his first piece of Beskar. And that's okay. That part's like that's the direction you want to go in. Start start getting him grown. At some point he's got to talk. Jesus fucking Christ. I'm just tired <laughs> of this. He's all what, already 90 years old or something. It could be a while. Yeah, that now that part is kind of interesting because he looked to be even a little bit smaller in the Order 66 flashback. I, I was thinking he hadn't changed much. Yeah, he, he hasn't changed a ton. Same. Yeah, But there's this implication that saving him was imperative. Yeah. But the problem is, for me personally, is that the show hasn't shown me that other than a brief reference here or a flashback in this episode. You know, it's just sitting on a particular reveal, I think. <sighs> mm-hmm. I think I would agree with you on that, because... Um, and they're wanting to milk it. Yeah. I mean, the the flashback scene was actually fine. Yeah, um, it was okay. It, was a, it made this episode a little overstuffed, I think, but it was fine. But yeah. I agree with you that they're... And they wanted to have their cake and eat it, too, where they're teasing us out. You said it was overstuffed, but also empty. Yeah. I, I felt like... I don't like the A plot, where they're going after the dinosaur thing really isn't that interesting you know it and it it kind of serves to like i guess 
Bo-Katan gets in a little bit better with the, whatever, the group of Mandalorians. But I don't know. I'm, I'm getting, I'm already kind of tired of them just like hanging out mm. in this Mandalorian base. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of like, let's, can we go back to, this is, this is probably going to sound uh, ridiculous, but I'm like, can we go more episodic? I did kind of like yeah. first and second season. You know, we had those great kind of like concept of the week. Uh-huh. Um, as one right like they do seven samurai for one they do wages of fear for one and they were fun Mm -hmm. and they're just i'm kind of tired of the mandalorians (laughs) i think it's everyone standing around with their helmet on as part of that that's part of it there's a way to do episodic storytelling and still be serialized in a way like Mm -hmm. they that's what they did in the first season yeah i think they did a good job yeah it's interesting that my reading of critics is that they I mean, they're obviously not saying this, but they tend to go all in episodic, all in serialized. But what about the blend, which I think is what the Mandalorian did well. Every episode this season has been has been fine, like it has been. But I don't know. It just it doesn't feel like we were getting like for, for a while there. It felt like we were getting many movies. Mm-hmm. It was just like we're, it's going to be a different concept every week, and you know they did some interesting things like with the former Imperials and all that. It mostly seems like the Mandalorian is just going on a bunch of fetch quests. Like he's got to go get the water. He's got to come back. He's got to <laughs> now. He's got to find a bird. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Feels video game esque because yeah, we it does. About, yeah, I think we've even mentioned that before about this show. It does. This episode kind of did. A couple of things, and you mentioned as far as the A plot of, if you consider the A plot being uh, Jaren and um, Bo-Katan, you know, there's them probably bonding a little, uh, her getting more used to the this sect of Mandalorian, which you've talked about. I think the third thing is to probably finalize Jaren's, Pedro Pascal's character as a true member of their group now. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it seemed as though, or we were supposed to understand that he and the bigger Mandalorian guy, uh, whose son they rescued, had a little beef, or they were at least at arm's length from one another. I think because um, in the second episode, maybe third episode, I think it was the second one. Isn't he the guy who's like, there's no way you really went to the waters. You know, like, he's got to be lying, you know. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I think that was him. Because he's that kind of cool... I, I I think it's kind of cool. He's got that kind of cool Gatling gun laser. Yeah, it's yeah. huge. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, folks. Is bringing home baby pterodactyls a good idea? I was. <laughs> that was <laughs> another moment where it was like, what is going on in the writers' room? <laughs> like, has anyone thought through the implications of this? <laughs> they got to feed them kids first off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What are uh, they gonna What are they gonna do with these pterodactyls? Exactly. What well, <laughs> writing? As far as writing is concerned, as far as the show is concerned, it's apparently the Mandalorian creed to save foundlings. That's how uh, Pedro Pascal's character became a Mandalorian. Right. So. Although, I, I wonder, uh, like, where on the sentient scale a found a foundling has to be? I don't know. Yeah. How 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 uh, how self aware? Uh, uh, like, does it have to be a person? Apparently, yeah. it can just be a weird bird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's we'll leave some room for our, our guys at uh, We Are a Star War podcast to dissect more of it. Uh, they're on a bit of a hiatus, but when they come back, I imagine they're going to talk a lot of Mandalorian. They're going to dive right into that Jar Jar connection. Yeah, they'll get into that. All that, sure. They'll they'll dive right into Jar Jar needs to come back. <laughs> they won't do that the people have spoken oh, yeah this is the way <laughs> let's talk about amc and their debut of lucky hank they debuted their new series with a regular of theirs bob odenkirk we all know him from breaking bad and better call saul as saul goodman i bet a lot of listeners recognize him from his days deep in comedy as part of the duo mr show did you love mr show yes yeah some of the, I, I mean, I don't want to get totally off the rails here, but um, like some of the, like he's so damn funny and so much to them. Like he's, there's one where he's, uh, he's the owner of like an adult bookstore mm-hmm. and his son's like wants to turn his back on pornography and he's like, pornography built this family. <laughs> 
a line it's, that it's might just, be used in this series. You never know. He's great. He's so funny. So Odenkirk and David Cross were in Mr. Show. But anyway, his new series on AMC is Lucky Hank, based off the novel Straight Man by Richard Russo. Show premiered Sunday, March 19. Hank, obviously played by Odenkirk, I said that. He's a professor and department chair of English in this relatively small college. He's kind of burned out, maybe by the job, maybe by the fact that he's only published the one book, can't seem to write another. It's making his luster wear thin. Um, We'll be discussing the first episode in depth, but no more. So just spoilers for the first. What did you think about the pilot? I thought that, to sum it up, I enjoyed it. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's that's the short review. The longer review, I guess, is um, I didn't think it was doing anything particularly that we hadn't seen before. You know, like we've seen like, okay, kind of like middle-aged white guys struggling with disappointment. But Mm -hmm. Bob Odenkirk was Mm -hmm. so... Like there's just something about him that makes it like, yeah, okay, I want to see, I want to see where this goes. I want to see this guy. He's he's funny. That's really where I landed. I mean, a hundred percent. Everything I thought and even wrote for a couple of notes here, I was interested throughout, and I'm glad I watched it. I found it very entertaining. Me I just, too. My disappointment and my nits that I'll pick stem from this expectation that I thought it would have more bite to it. Mm-hmm. I have not read the book. Have you read Straight Man by Russo? I've read the book. Um, oh, okay. It's been a while, so I don't, okay. I don't remember it super well. And that might be for the best. I think so. Watching the show. This show's probably just going to take a lot of the premises from that and, and run with it. I wanted Odenkirk to go off the leash and be much more scathing like he is in that first scene. And I think that maybe that, that was part of my expectation. Mm-hmm. Was I had a little coming in and then I saw this first scene where he chews out this this kid this student named Bartow who thinks his own writing's fantastic and then most of the episode it was kind of a little more of the same that you would get from Bob Odenkirk which is great it's fantastic mm-hmm. but it's still a little more of the same I think I wanted it to either go in a blistering direction mm-hmm. or swing into a more lacrimose direction or, or a melancholy direction and it didn't really do either one of those um, You're right, that's, it didn't. That's not fair of me to say, here's what I wanted. It's, uh, you know, you would like to judge things by what it, they presented. And what they presented was what you're talking about was a little bit more the same kind of thing we see. Middle-aged white guy, upset, burned out. Mm-hmm. But it's got time to be plenty of blistering as well as melancholy. And I, I found it, you know, I found it enjoyable. Um, I did think that the... I mean, worked at a big university. The uh, the faculty politics were very funny. It, Is that it true was... to life? <laughs> I can't comment publicly. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> or is it? Was it more played up in the episode, or is it similar? I don't know. I'm I'm real curious. You know, it depends. Honestly, like sometimes. <laughs> I mean, they do play it up a little bit, but sometimes the faculty are just, uh, especially the ones that are like aware of their own importance. Mm-hmm. Are, are, can be a little much. That happens in the high school arena, but not as much because we don't have published authors right. nearly as, as much. The idea that old Hank, Bob Odenkirk, Hank Devereaux Jr., is so bored by his job that he just makes the students talk the whole time <laughs> is something I can get on board with. <laughs> you know, that he notices and recognizes he's at a middling college as part of the problem. I thought, now those things, these ideas are good. The... The execution of them as far as acting is good. It's yes. somewhere in the middle. It's where it's not. I don't think I saw enough of him being like, this is a middling college and I can't stand these kids <laughs> because they're middling or because I'm bored or both. I did like how he was just getting increasingly flippant as the episode went on. You know, I think that's something I needed to catch again. I might need to watch that episode at least a little of it again because... I heard another person say he gets more flippant as the episode goes on. I don't know if I picked up on it. Maybe it was as too it, subtle yeah. for me. I think as it as it goes on, he just gets more and more. You know, the worse things get, the less seriously he's going to take them. And that could be really fun. I did like. Um, I don't know why, <laughs> but I thought the the scene where Bardo confronts him, he's like, "I've come to face you, like a man." <laughs> 
There's something about like the way Bob Odenkirk's face looks as yeah. he's looking at this kid. <laughs> yeah, it was great. That was you know it, it which is to 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 say it did things that made me laugh. It did, yeah. And I enjoy and I enjoyed. I found it to be an enjoyable experience for sure. Watching it, quite enjoyable. Not quite the belly laughs for me personally, but I did, you know, a, a chuckle or something like that. Oh yeah. Um, Even uh, predictable things, right? Like him, you know, it's completely predictable, right? Like he gets vote of no confidence for the chair, and then the next day he's the chair again for three more years. And it's, you know, you probably could have seen it a mile away, but it was still fun. I laughed. It was still funny. Okay, so that's the thing. You can see it a mile away. And on the screen, it didn't create laughter for me because it was a little telegraph, but... In hindsight, it's very, very comical of a thing, especially if you place it in the reality we live in. If you, if, if that kind of thing happens, it's hilarious because of the stupidity of mankind, really. <laughs> <laughs> yes. James Ponowozik from the New York Times does say that this show differs from those usual white guy uh, midlife crisis shows by focusing and staying in the mediocrity rather than pushing it out into a meth business or a mafia hit or I'm going to go join a gang. Right. He's just stuck in it. Yeah, so there might be promise even there. Did you think of white noise at all from this episode? A little bit. I did too. A they had a bit. very similar campus feel. They did. What what is what is this thing in white noise? It's Hitler studies, right? Like he's mm-hmm. basically yeah. And then here, that's a little bit more like white noise. It's a little bit um, pointedly sarcastic. Well, is what yeah, I would like say. broad. The, the comedy's a little broader too. Yeah, yeah. For the campus that. part, but yeah, they they both kind of thinking about overlapping things, maybe. <laughs> yeah, just the the ridiculousness of of academia at times. Yes. I think is where the overlap was. Did this pilot want to reckon with how annoyed we get with unfiltered honesty? <laughs> because that's what I took from it. That's actually a good question. We're annoyed with all... We like him, sort of, but we're pretty annoyed by Hank because his honesty is starting to get more and more unfiltered, like you talk yes. about. He's, he's increasingly uh, saying exactly what he thinks. And there's this idea of I'm unfulfilled, and I think we all can relate to that, even if it is a old white guy version Mm -hmm. of it once again. Uh, There's the shadow of his dad, yep, the retired literary critic in New York, and you might know more having read the book. That's that's obviously going to play out. There's no way it doesn't. So you probably know a little bit more of what we should make of it than I. He's got a little bit of a... What, 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 sort of an Oedipus complex with his dad there. You know, he never live up to his father. Can't write the book. Mm, can't get to the front page of the art section, you know. Mm. Like, it's totally stuck in his dad's shadow. I will be keeping my eye out for how that plays. I really, again, not to have expectations and hopes, but that's I think that's a problem you have when you're only talking about the pilot or the first episode of something. Mm-hmm. But I, I hope that this is going to continue to cre- critique a generation of college students that we haven't seen critiqued yet on f- film, not fully. And academia and how it is regarding any kind of change. Yeah, um, and it's mi- kind of critiquing um, col- the college kids and their parents. You know, where oh, yeah. kind of, you know, like, we didn't, we were so afraid of our kids feeling anything that the second they mm-hmm. feel something, <laughs> mm-hmm. we rush in and try and save them. Which, his daughter... Will mm-hmm. will be an important symbol of some of that stuff. It can also mess around with men and women in the workplace. Mm-hmm. It, it could. So there's promise here, and Bob Odenkirk will keep you coming back, even if there's an episode or two or three that falter compared to other television. I think. I think that's my case there. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um, that's kind of like my longer review is. We've, we've seen it before, but Bob Burton Kirk makes it really fun. And he's believable in the role. He's great. Yeah. I, I, I buy him as a burned-out professor. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm looking forward to Kyle McLaughlin showing up. 
That's another thing I was going as, to mention as, as we as slowly the president of the college. <laughs> because he was teased in the trailer, and it, hey, it's 45 minutes every week. You're going to get Bob Odenkirk. You're going to get uh, maybe the promise of Kyle McLaugh- McLaughlin in the next episode. I wish I honestly could see the second episode now. We we run a, not a week behind, a couple of days behind the show's airing. So it's only an ep- eight episodes first season. Yeah. And that, too, is, in a way, for me, promising because it won't outstay its welcome. It's not going to be a 10 or 12 episode kind of thing where they want to, well, they'll, they'll be spread too thin on some plot lines. And, again, I brought up some things that this show could explore, and it could definitely surprise us and explore even more. I did enjoy uh, the way, especially the the poet, uh, the woman who writes poetry, she's like, no one was brave enough to publish it. <laughs> What do you make of, uh, is her name Gracie, the one who calls him as she's drinking wine by the fire? Bobby, right? Isn't that Bobby? Bobby, Bobby. Okay, yeah. so what did you make of her? She, she's also uh, doesn't care. No, she's she kind doesn't of like his, he, uh, She's kind of a foil to him. I mean, a little bit. A little bit? With, or, or, and even with, a mirror, even. Yeah, so. where they're, they're, you're getting that unfiltered honesty. You're getting the, I'm burnt out and I don't care. And then she's kind of able to... Well, not call him out exactly, but when she's like, don't write that letter for my daughter because I don't want her to live in this town. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, he's he's kind of like, and he can't, he seemingly can't leave. You know, that seems to be like a point of mm-hmm. contention with him mm-hmm. and his wife. Yeah, well, yeah. Episode one has him contemplating the idea of moving to New York. Always wanted to do it. Can't. Can't pull the trigger. He will, he will not do it. What is it about the town that keeps him there or that middling college or it, it's imposter syndrome you know there's that too mm-hmm. and that'll burn you out as quick as anything yeah i agree well if you made it this far in our conversation and was just wondering if you should watch it if you if you ever feel burned out on anything if you ever feel like you're you know swimming in one spot this might be a really good show for you yeah seems like it would be well, we've reached the end of our podcast this week, uh, but we're online. Find the show on Twitter and Instagram, both at Taking It Down Pod, one word. But our home site and production team are all at the Alabama Take on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We'll be back next week to talk maybe more Lucky Hank, maybe more Perry Mason. Not sure. Stay with us online, and we always send out notifications a couple of days early. See you then. <laughs>